I wanted to, to discuss a little bit about how Logo, a, a the first language designed for children got started. Um, it got started before there were um, turtles. Turtles became a very important part of the Logo world. And I show you um, a couple of turtle types that were available in 1970. This time, I want to take you back and, whoops, sorry. Uh, yes, click. I wanted to remind you of what computing was like in the late 60s. This is, um, time sharing started in around 1964. That means that more than one person could use a computer at the same time, or that you didn't have to submit decks of cards, that you could actually interact with a computer. Um, and here is a picture of a small time-shared computer. It only filled one room. And it was the Digital Equipment Corporation's first computer. It's PDP-1. Another thing that was going on in the 1960s was a feeling of reform and revolution, a reaction to um, the United States losing to the Soviet Union the space war and that they got the satellite going before the into the sky before the United States did. So, well, that meant uh, a focus on education. And there was a lot of, in the early 60s and throughout, uh, a lot of uh, new ideas about how to teach mathematics and science in K-12 education. At the same time, this was really in the late 60s, there was a tremendous anti-war movement and the Civil Rights Act that got passed in the United States, this is all sort of focused on the United States, um, was passed in 1964 and its implementation and acceptance, shall we say, was slow. And so there were lots and lots of civil rights protests. So there was just a sense of let's make change in the air. So Seymour coming along saying, let's have a programming language designed for children, which meant um, naive users, learners, um, just not a language that was designed for adult, uh, adults. And so um, it was for him a, a, an accumulation of experiences. In 1964, Seymour came to MIT, uh, joined the, at that time, the artificial intelligence group to work with Marvin Minsky on making machines intelligent. He had before that, for the past, the five years prior to coming to MIT, he had been in Geneva, Switzerland, working with Jean Piaget, who is the father of constructivist thinking and um, developmental psychology, the belief that children were not empty vessels, that they had theories and they constructed their own knowledge. Their theories were different from adult theories. And that what was interesting is how did they reach these other theories? They did it from their interactions with the world. And, um, and the other element that went into uh, the design of Logo was um, Seymour was consulting at Bo Peranek and Newman 
a research company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was working. Um, and he consulted with Wally Feuerzeig, who was head of the education technology group, which I was a member of. <laughs> and there was a project going on involving, I think, five or eight different schools and five different school systems where they were using a programming language called Telcomp, uh, BBN's adaptation of um, a, a language, a JOS, a language similar to BASIC. And Seymour was astounded watching children learn, trying to learn algebra using an algebraic programming language. And so he really um, wanted to design a new language. So in 1966, um, Seymour presented to us, uh, and us being, there were four of us, uh, 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 specs for this new language. And we thought of it as Baby Lisp. Um, there's Seymour Nee, Danny Barbro, who did the, began the first implementation of Logo in Lisp, and Wally Feuerzeig. Um, and um, by, th these were the powerful ideas underlying the, burgeoning culture, procedural thinking. Logo was a procedural programming language, like Lisp. Debugging was the most important activity in this environment. You really, things weren't wrong, they were just buggy. Um, and we, work, we thought of projects rather than syntactic lessons. And there also was, um, anthropomorphic thinking, procedures, programs, pieces of program, they were, um, we thought of them, we could identify with them and we encouraged the identification that, that maybe debugging a procedure could help us in debugging ourselves. And um, with Logo, uh, the names of things, names of procedures, names of inputs, outputs, were not limited to three characters. They could be almost of any length, like Lisp. And that made it easier to think about what those names represented. And these, we always thought of programs as objects to play with. And of course, later there were more concrete objects that came about. So um, by 1967, there was a working logo in LISP running on BBN's SDS 940, which was a big time sharing system. And um, Seymour uh, taught and Wally and I observed him doing a, like a two or three week class with some 10 year olds. And as a result of that experience, we totally redesigned Logo and a new implementation was begun. Uh, BBN had this digital equipment PDP-1, like I showed you a picture of in the beginning that nobody was using. So it became the Logo computer. And um, by 1968, there was a logo running on it. And Seymour and I worked with 12 year olds there in the seventh grade in the United States at a junior high school. Um, now they're middle schools, but in those days they were junior high schools. Um, and uh, we had teletypes in a classroom um, going over phone lines back to the machine at BBN, the computer at BBN. And um, there's Seymour and me and a, a young lady, and though there's an ex a better picture of teletypes. We had model 33s and model 35s. And um, 
they were um, here's an example of the kind of actually one of the things Seymour and I did not start out to be the teachers um, we uh, had um, hired a math teacher who was a wonderful wonderful teacher to be the teacher and um, I, I, I went away and when I came back, I visited the school and I was really shocked at, because what she was doing is teaching syntax, what the print command does <laughs> and so on and not projects because she didn't have a background. And I think that's important. So um, Seymour and I took over and um, our first project I remember was uh, Pig Latin. But one of our projects that was very interesting to do with the children was sentence generators. And this young lady talking with Seymour wrote this, her sentence generator, this is an example of what her sentence generator eventually produced <clears throat> and here's a code in logo that produces sentence generators but what was interesting about these seventh graders is they didn't pay any attention to categorizing words so their first almost universally their first programs were gibberish actually wrote a, they wrote a gibberish program which was like pit Latin, but that's beside the point. Anyway, their, their big reaction was, oh, that's why they call them nouns and verbs. So once they uh, reorganized th their categories, then they could make interesting sentence generators. And this led us to suggesting to them that um, they, uh, make math sentence generators. And here's an example. Um, and what came out of this was kind of interesting. You can see Jen nine, whoops, uh, nine times box, et cetera, what is box? And it would keep asking what is box until you typed in the right answer. And at first what does, some of the students did was give the kinds of nasty comments. Uh, you know, wrong, you're stupid. And they started using their own programs and they didn't like being insulted. So they, they started um, changing the responses and they also, you know, started writing um, programs to help and that was an interesting experience and much better CAI than the, uh, that is computer aided instruction, which was very popular at the time. And this was um, a much better example of what you could do. Anyway, so Logo grew from thinking about making computers intelligent, from thinking about children as theory builders, and from thinking about how to put the computing into the hands of learners. And um, a thing that I don't say there is listening to the learners. And I think that's very, very important because um, as I say that Piaget showed us and it has been held true that children have theories. And so how do we build on those theories? How do we build on what they know to help them learn more? Um, so in 1969, at the end of that year of teaching the seventh graders, two things came about. Seymour felt we needed a more concrete plaything for the children. And that's how turtles came about. Turtles were either on the floor or on a display screen and they obeyed 
fundamental commands, forward, back, left, right. And they had pens so that, at which they could raise and lower. And so in the summer of 1969, I joined Seymour at the MIT AI lab. At that, by then it was an AI lab where Seymour and Marvin were co-directors. And um, I mean, sort of subliminally, Marvin had always had an influence because he and Seymour would talk about what, about thinking and children and how they think. And I, would talk to Seymour about projects and children and how they think. And then Seymour would talk to Marvin and then Seymour would come back to me about the ideas. So, um, the, although um, BBN started working on floor turtles at MIT, um, the hacker culture, which Tomas mentioned, was certainly enforced. They loved both Marvin and Seymour. They were, and were part of the AI lab. And so um, we had turtles. And um, by 19, the spring of 1970. When I think about Marvin and Seymour's, their views, was that um, about computers, it's that uh, th these two uh, statements come to mind. And I love what Marvin says, that programs make things come to be where nothing ever was before. And that the only thing are, the only impediments are the ones inside you. Um, so, in the spring of 1970, um, Seymour gave a pub, there, a public symposium was held at MIT. And one of Seymour's best papers, it's an early paper called Teaching Children Thinking, um, was named after this conference. And it, um, it was, um, 750 people attended, and so that was um, a big kickstart. Um, in 1970, the fall of 1970, Seymour and I again team taught, this time planned from the beginning, and um, we worked with fifth graders, 10 year olds at a uh, local public school in, again, Lexington, Massachusetts. Lexington had a very, very um, experiential superintendent who welcomed us to experiment. Marvin built a four voice music box for um, for logo, and um, you can see there's the yellow turtle that was assembled. the The outside was was found at a um, DoD graveyard, and but that the insides were built at the MIT AI lab. And then there was a floor turtle also built there. And they both had pens. Um, um, and you can see there's a picture of these boys pointing to a graphic screen. I'm sorry, the, the picture is kind of hazy. Um, some of you may know of Hal Abelson, who um, wrote a book called Turtle Geometry and also uh, worked with Jerry Sussman on the uh, MIT Introductory Computer Course, 6001 for 20 years or so. Jer uh, Hal was a first year doctoral student in the math department and he 
worked on getting turtle graphics to work. So it was a portable system. It was a, uh, a desk size computer and that graphic screen and we had it in the school and again over phone lines back to MIT. Um, so, let's see. Um, as we explored what turtles could do, or we could do with turtles, a theorem popped up, the total turtle trip theorem, which uh, is about if, a, if the turtle, or you as the turtle, because we played turtle a lot, um, started walking and went forward a fixed amount and turned left or right a fixed amount, you would come back to your starting position or you would be walking in a straight line to infinity. But if you modified how, with the steps that you took, you would walk in a spiral. Now here's Seymour. This was a video made in the spring of 1972. Let a child learn mathematics by speaking in mathematics about things that really matter to him. So at MIT, we've given computers the power to turn motors, make sounds, draw pictures, and we've found ways of giving children the power to control the computer. Now they'll put their little tunes together to make bigger ones. Sometimes I get into bugs like this, and it'll, um, when it was doing it in his mind, the little turtle, the little triangle thing, um, was on an angle, so it drew the picture on, on an angle. A computer-controlled turtle is made to draw and dance by programs so simple that all children invent them in the first days of the course. Thus the child acquires a taste for math power that grows and grows as his projects become more original, more complex, and more varied. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I have a hard time finding. Mm. Okay. Uh, oh, and this is one of the things we were always looking for were um, procedural thinking applied to other things. So here is a bongo board and me pushing Seymour and him staying on the balance. Um, and this is um, a child without instruction trying to stay on the board. <laughs> so, um, we, taught, we taught these um, children to walk on stilts, to juggle, to um, walk on the bongo board. To, to, we started teaching them a little bit to ride a unicycle. Um, in, in, the, um, spring, in the summer of 1972, there was a math education conference in Exeter, England. And um, a new version of LOGO was being implemented on a PDP-11, a digital equipment PDP-11. And Exeter, the university bought one. And so it got shipped with, um, and we had uh, built um, special um, gr turtle graphics workstations. And they got shipped too by deck. And so a month before the conference, uh, me and a group went to England and I uh, worked with 10 to 12 year olds for a month, three weeks before the conference. And what crystallized that summer was that we needed to get turtles out in the world. So 
Marvin Seymour, me, and a couple of other people formed a company called General Turtle, where the, and here's a product, where um, music and turtles were made available. Um, and uh, so this was before, see, before microcomputers. Anyway, the next thing, uh, maybe, how is my time? I don't, oh, part of the, what happened with that company is Marvin got to work and designed a logo computer. And now this video is very poor quality. But it had vector graphics. This machine. Yes, small, very powerful which has the ability to impart gear to run two kinds of displays. Uh, this is the essential processor itself. This is a display which shows printed material and several kinds of fonts. In fact, you can design your own time font or you do a little and this is called the vector scope, which can show pictures made of lines and curves and points, and can show pictures that move quite rapidly and animation that you can program. I'd like to introduce Professor Seymour Papert of MIT, who developed the programming language that we use for this kind of animation. who designed and built this machine. I'll show you how simple it is to write some very some pictures in the language that we've developed for children and other people. Um, that's just to give you a taste. That was 1974. Um, what happened? Uh, uh, with uh, 2500 is it, it for, eventually became a business machine and um, it was kind of swept away by microcomputers and the um, the logo group at MIT worked on a version of logo for the TI-99-4, which is what's on the, what this is a picture of. Um, the, um, the, the founders of, uh, of uh, TI went to MIT as undergraduates and they had one of them or two of them had grandchildren at a school in Dallas, Texas called the Lamplighter School. And they wanted when the this um, T in the 99 slash four came out, they wanted their children to benefit. And the thing about it is it had a sprite board in it. So you could have 32 turtles or sprites, whatever you want to call. It. And that board was originally designed by one of the logo team, Danny Hillis. Um, Anyway, I bring that up because it gave it for the first time multiple turtles and color and and so opened up to all kinds of thinking about objects and um, in nineteen eighty I was involved in making a new version of logo for the Apple computer and I, I this I wrote the manual here, and I was director of the thing. And um, we started another company called Logo Computer Systems, which exists now in a slightly. I'm not part of it, but anyway. So <laughs> um, when I finished that, Alan Kay set me up as director of uh, a research lab right near MIT for Atari. He was chief scientist at the time for Atari. And 
Yeah, our is... research has been motivated by our past experiences in the LOGO group at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, where we worked with Seymour Packard and Marvin Minsky. We looked at ways to control computers through gestures, by touch, and by gross body movement. We designed an object-oriented logo and developed applications in it. We built several mechanical devices to add new dimensions to computing environments. We began to build tools toward a musical PlayStation. And as always, we continued our work with children. Cute. This logo was uh, done by Logo Computer Systems. Um, oh. Okay, part of the, so this lab lasted two and a half years and then Atari got sold and it went away. But one of the things we did, um, we collected a lot of programming projects in Logo that our friends had created and we made a book. Of course, it came out just as Atari took a nosedive. But it is online. You can see what we did if you want. Um, and then I'm, this is more personal. I went back and finished my doctorate. And this is what I wrote. This too is online. And it's, um, it talks about four different uses of computers. Drill and practice, Socratic discovery learning, uh, heuristic programming and constructivism and Piaget learning. This is before the word constructionism uh, became popular. Anyway, these are, this is also popular. And in the 90s, I'm going quickly now, uh, Seymour got involved with Lego and his group designed um, motors, et cetera, and how to talk to them. And there was a Lego logo, but eventually TI, um, Lego re, replaced it with a um, different lab view, with a lab view. Um, anyway, here's an example of thing of today, turtle art logo, snap. Um, my more recent project was um, Marvin Minsky had six education essays. One of them he wrote as an introduction to the Logo Works book. The other five he wrote um, for one laptop per child. And they're wonderful. Every time I read one, I learn something new. And so I, edit, I edited it and I got my friend who had just finished her doctorate at the Media Lab, Xiao Xiao, to illustrate. And she made 80 illustrations for it. Um, there's Xiao Xiao on a swing in Marvin's living room with Marvin below. Um, and uh, Marvin had some wonderful things to say. I'm going to try to, I, I, I like- and One of the troubles with education theory until recently is that people had this idea that the best way to learn is to make it a positive experience. Everything should be good. The child should be guided to make very small steps so that they can't make any serious mistakes and then you learn everything and when you're all done you can do the job without thinking because you know exactly what to do well i don't think that kind of learning leads to uh, becoming very good at new problems because you haven't learned enough about bugs what you really got to do is to teach children to enjoy being wrong <laughs> yes i agree and one of the troubles so um, here are the people I asked to write introductions uh, or something about each of the six essays that Marvin wrote, and you might recognize them. 
they um, had played important role in Marvin's life and Marvin played important roles in their lives. And they've done wonderful things in the world. So the other thing that um, Tomas mentioned, and he was the shepherd for, and this too is available. Oh, actually Marvin's essays, that book is available in PDF for free on the MIT Press website and um, it, as an open access book. And this paper that I wrote with these people, the, uh, these are the people that I wrote it with. They too had experiences with Logo in different ways and with Seymour and Marvin. And um, we squabbled a lot. <laughs> um, one of the things, and this is, um, this is the end, but I have to tell you about this. Um, somebody I taught, I, I was a teacher for a while at a, mm, a school in Boston, and, um, and it was fourth grade, and they wrote projects for their Egyptian history. And this child wrote a project based on the book with Jedi, where this young man had to um, go from Alexandria to Spain and avoid sharks and other menacing things. So this was a game. And um, he, he's now um, a very, very competent, um, computer scientist, and he just suddenly decided to get it to work again, and so he sent me the code, and that uh, it's a wonderful thing. After umpteen years, somebody loves what they did, and it changed them. Anyway, um, I, I uh, want to end this by saying that um, I think a lot of what we did is very relevant today. And the thing is uh, that bugs are fun, frustrating, difficult, and, um, and that children have good ideas that need guidance. And I hope you enjoyed this. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I really, really appreciate it. Let's, let's hear it, a big clap for her. Oh, so, yes. <laughs> so Thomas, do you want to handle the Q&A or uh, shall I go ahead with it? Uh, well, I think we can jump in, but I think you, you're, go ahead. you're in a better position to be the, the leading. <laughs> yes, I've got my children at home, so. <laughs> so, okay, so um, we've got a first question. Um, um, from Heiko Goes. Uh, Heiko, if you're there, can you mute yourself and go ahead and ask? Yeah, it's a pleasure. First, uh, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. I'm a little bit older, I'm 32, and I really used Apple logo and I enjoyed it so much. And I even used it for, for teaching uh, in, I think, 2010 or so, and it worked brilliantly. So thanks a lot for this. Um, yeah, my question is, um, um, I'm very um, yeah, excited about functional programming and I think, I don't know, what do you think about the proposal to learn students functional programming languages first, not the uh, procedural languages with loops and so on, but, but uh, yeah, thinking, thinking like, uh, how, how do you call it, um, moment. Um, Oh, I don't have it. Um, not not uh, uh, not not the steps, but what do you want to achieve? You know. I think the important thing is that um, uh, I don't know whether the language matters. I think what matters is capturing the children's interest and. Um, so 
if uh, so that's the major thing i always felt um and it gets harder today but i had to do something with them that they couldn't do without a computer and that was not complicated initially that they could really get into and that's really what mattered logo logo it needs to be revised and various people have thought about revision in a way scratch is a revision but it leaves out a lot of things in another way snap is a revision but it leaves out uh, things so i'm not sure that language is in, as important as what do you do with it okay thank you thank you so there's a um follow-up question which um well the two actually follow-up questions here which which were very relevant um first um onorio catenacci if you're there can you mute yourself and ask hi how are you doing francesco hi onorio <laughs> Good to hear you. Uh, which one are you thinking of? As a, I got a couple. I'm so sorry. Uh, that is correct. So um, what is on the foundational skills? It's a question okay. of the foundational skills. Yeah. Was, was the one I'm I, thinking of. Yeah, I I noticed like with children, as much as as much we want to avoid teaching things by rote, that you know, eventually we learn our multiplication tables. Eventually we learn, you know, this is a noun, this is a verb, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some of that is kind of rote learning. What would you consider foundational skills for computer science? Like learning how to code a loop, how variables should be initialized. What kinds of things would you consider are, are very important fundamental skills that you know we should try and reinforce to children learning software development? Again, um, I, I have a project-oriented vision. So if what they have to know is part, to build this project is about um, variables and you, they better learn it. I mean, it's, it's that I, it's, it's um, like I don't know about multiplication tables, but if you need to know something, then you need to do it. And there are different ways of learning it. I'm not against whatever's called rote learning. Um, if it's mixed in with the reason for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, um, there's another really interesting question from Nathan Rennie. I hope I pronounced your name right. Nathan, are you there? So I'll go ahead and ask it, um, you know, whilst we find the unmute button. So Nathan is asking if you have noticed any difference between what engages and interests boys and girls when learning to program. Um, yes and no. It, uh, a lot of it depends um, what, uh, what they say they want to do sometimes is based on gender, but what they do is not necessarily based on gender. And it's based on interest or how interesting that is. So, um, but that's my experience. And yet I see um, I, I think it really, uh, the teacher does have an influence on what people do. And since I'm, I, when I'm teaching, I work very hard. I, I've um, worked with, like Seymour and I worked with children who were in the middle range. Um, and we worked very hard at what would attract them what would get them involved. Um, so that's a teacher's role and important. Is that it? You're mute. 
Oh. Sorry. Oh, of course, oh. I'm muted. Of course, I had to do that. So we've got a question from Jane Waite from uh, Queen Mary University of London. And she'll actually, uh, for everyone here, there's going to be an Ask Me Anything session with, uh, with Cynthia and Jane and possibly also Simon Peyton Jones um, during the first break on teaching children to code, which you're welcome to join and also ask more questions. But Jane, you had a question as well. If you can unmute yourself and ask, are you there? So uh, I'll, I'll ask the question. So um, what do you think are the opportunities for using constructionism in the teaching of programming to adults who work in the industry? So how do you actually go in and train the adults who then go in and teach the children to, to program? Um, I'm not sure. How to teach adults or how to teach adults to teach, to teach children? How to teach adults to teach children to program? Well, at the the thing about adults is that they forget that they can be children, that they can enjoy and have an aha. Most workshops, the best ones are the ones that, um, for which you feel safe to say, I don't know, <laughs> I'm confused. I'm in one of those workshops now. And um, I complain a lot. I want to make a comment, uh, and maybe you could comment back. I noticed that there were very few women in this session. Um, I, I sort of breezed through, and maybe there are five. I don't think there are that many. And that surprised me. <laughs> So yeah, it's uh, it's something we've been working very hard on, you know, to try to 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 counteract. And it's I think uh, usually Code Mesh uh, has about a twenty percent um, female attendance. You know, uh, statistically for the past, which we've managed to occupy for the past two to three years. Yeah, um, and I suspect it's also very much also a time uh, time problem. I think there were a lot of. Uh, Yesterday, for example, I think there were a lot uh, who were working, but it's, it's getting you know, a bit late here in Europe on, on, on a Friday. Oh. Um, yes. So, uh, but usually I think it is something, looking at the diversity, it's something we've been working on you know, really hard. It's been in the ethos of, of, of it's, it's in the, been in the spirit of the conference uh, you know, to actually work on you know, creating diversity you know, among speakers, but also amongst attendees. So, and, and for that, you know, we also have diversity sponsors, um, Jens Simple and Klarna, who have allowed us you know, to give away free tickets. So I suspect it's more a question of time. Uh, yeah, Thank more you. than them not being here, yes. Uh, there was one last question. Um, uh, and uh, it's again, so Honorio, you had another question, which I think was really good. And, um, and then, yes, I think we'll... Uh, I, th I think she yes. may have already answered it for me. Okay, what yeah. sorts of differences would you see between adults attempting to learn software yes. development versus children? That was the question. Yeah. Um, it, well, it varies. Sometimes they're the same. And other times, um, again, it, it's... Um, it depends why they're wanting to, for adults, it depends why they want to learn. Because I've been in situations where they've been told they have to learn and, and they're very reticent to learn. But I've also been with uh, like high school students, middle schools, high school students who are the same. Um, I worry about, I, I tell you, my major worry is with elementary, with uh, children um, of, how do you say, elementary, is that primary, elementary, um, up yes. to 12 years old, um, that, that the kind of experience they have is not the kind of experience they would have with me that there's no joy in what they're doing. That it's, um, it, it sort of reminds me of uh, code.org. I, I did a few of the code.org things and I was always wrong 
although I was correct. So, because if you don't, the, the programmers who were writing the code weren't too smart. They didn't have any AI or something. And I had to do it their way or the highway. And um, I'm afraid that, that for young children, the excitement that I have because of, I do a lot. I, oh, I forgot to show those slides, uh, what I do. I've been doing a lot of turtle stitch. Do you know what turtle stitch is? Um, somebody named, um, oh, I should show the slide. Um, um, I'm blocking names, decided <laughs> to um, make some software that lets you talk to an embroidery machine. And she set up um, <clears throat> Turtle Stitch, which there's a turtle, and you tell the turtle, uh, you use, uh, it's embedded in, in Snap, so you use Snap language forward and turn and um, do things. And I'm so excited by it. I spend so much time debugging. I, I meant to show it, but I thought I went on too long. Uh, I, I guess I could, if I went uh, to the next slide. Oh, here. Andrea Mayer Stalder and Michael Ashour. And this is an example. This is the kind of thing I do in Turtle Stitch. And this is what it looks like. I, I've been embroidering on cardstock and not fabric. And the middle one with the turtles is done on fabric. And the other thing is, so this is what I've been doing is taking turtle things and I've been using now a cutting machine and taking turtle designs and cutting them. And I get very excited and spend a lot of time debugging. Oops, yeah, that's it. All right. Well, Cynthia, thank you so much on behalf of everyone, not only for your know, talking and sharing all of this uh, with us today, but also for everything you've done you know, to help bring computer science to where it is today. It's been a pleasure having you. Uh, let's hear it. A big clap for Cynthia. Yes. Thank you.